In this video, I'm going to break down different cases within neuroradiology that are must-know diagnoses. These are specifically neuro-CT cases on CT head examinations without contrast. These are diagnoses that you can easily, as a clinician, open up the scan and make by yourself in case the radiologist is behind and you can't reach them and you need an answer very quickly. So without further ado, I'm going to get going through the first case that I have already pulled up on the screen here. So this is a CT head without contrast in a patient with acute right-sided weakness. So when I hear that, I'm immediately thinking of a left-sided insult. And this is very confusing, but the right side of the picture is the left side of the patient's brain. You're looking at the patient as if you're at their feet looking up. So the right side of the picture here, the right side of your screen, is the left side of the patient's brain. And the thing that I'm worried about when I hear those symptoms is an acute left-sided stroke, particularly the middle cerebral artery. So as I'm going through here, I don't see any changes in the cortex or the gray-white differentiation, which I'll get to later. But basically, you should be able to see a difference between the cortex and the subcortical white matter, which is the darker stuff is the white matter. The cortex is brighter. And if you start to see blurring there, you're worried about an acute stroke, and we'll see some cases of that later. In this case, I don't see that, but what I do see is this. This is the middle cerebral artery. Notice how bright it is when you compare it to the other side. See on the other side on the right how it doesn't just pop? On the left side of the patient, it's very dense. And it's dense because there is acute thrombus within the left middle cerebral artery, meaning that it is occluded and that the patient is having an acute left MCA stroke. This is the proximal aspect of the middle cerebral artery and something that potentially a neurointerventional radiologist can go retrieve. So when you see this, there are a couple things you should do. First, you should order a STAT CTA head and neck. This is an exam that targets the extracranial and intracranial arteries so you can identify the exact location of the thrombus. And the other thing to keep in mind is sometimes these can be dense and there's not actually an acute occlusion. Like in this case, this is real. That's definitely an occluded MCA. So if you've got the CTA, you would see an occluded artery here. But sometimes patients just have dense atherosclerotic disease that can kind of fake you out. So you want to definitely confirm that it's real. In this case, I feel confident that this is real and that this patient's going to have an occluded MCA. But after getting the CTA, the head and neck, assuming that's positive, or if you're just suspicious enough, get in touch with interventional radiology, specifically the interventional neuroradiologist, because they can potentially go and retrieve this thrombus, and they have different criteria for intervening or not, and that'll just depend on the preferences of the interventionalist and also the characteristics of the patient, but definitely give them a call. Leave it up to them to make the decision whether or not this patient should be intervened on. So that's the first case. That is an acute left middle cerebral artery stroke. That is a dense left middle cerebral artery. Can't miss diagnosis. If it's there, it's one of the first things you'll see in an acute stroke. This next case is kind of a companion to the first one. In this case, the pathology is on the right. And I talked about the loss of gray-white differentiation. So in an acute stroke, you'll lose the normal difference between the cortex and the subcortical white matter. The white matter is darker here, as you can see where my cursor is. That's all white matter. The cortex outlines the white matter, and it's much more dense. So as I'm scrolling through here, I scroll anteriorly. I don't see anything. Now I'm going posteriorly. And right here. So notice here you have dense cortex. Here that's kind of gone, and you can't really differentiate the cortex from the white matter. This is a finding of infarcting brain. You have loss of gray-white differentiation due to cytotoxic edema, meaning as the cells are dying, you develop edema. That edema causes the gyri to swell, and you have sulcal effacement, and you also lose that nice gray-white differentiation that you normally see. So as you scroll through here again, notice that you just don't see that cortex there, and it's completely gone. This patient has an acute right middle cerebral artery territory infarct. And you can actually see a dense vessel here. This is a dense vessel, so this is probably where the thrombus is, just like in the last case. Thrombus is dense, so a vessel that pops all of a sudden like that, that's thrombus. As you can see, it's less dense as you track it back here. That's vessel here. As you go posteriorly, it's much more dense, so that's where your thrombus is. And this is the sequela of that thrombus. This is an acute, evolving right MCA territory infarct. This next case is just a single image, and it reflects a hemorrhage within the basal ganglia on the left. Hemorrhage is bright on CT. So anything bright, think hemorrhage. This is a actually a relatively small hemorrhage within the putamen on the left. There is a little bit of mass effect. Notice the frontal horn of the right lateral ventricle on this side is bigger than the one on the left. That's because the mass effect related to this hemorrhage that is occupying brain parenchyma and displacing normal brain parenchyma elsewhere. It's kind of effacing the frontal horn of the left lateral ventricle. But the degree of mass effect is not that bad, and this is a relatively small hemorrhage. But when you see a hemorrhage in this location on either side or involving like the thalamus, 
or any of the basal ganglia, think hypertension. Hypertension is the most common cause of a hemorrhage like this. And within the basal ganglia, it's relatively classic for a hypertensive hemorrhage. If you see something in the lobes, like in the frontal lobe, if like I saw something out here where I'm circling with my cursor, there are different things you have to think of. In a young person, you always want to rule out an arteriovenous malformation or potentially a cavernoma, which is kind of a vascular type lesion as well. A young person that doesn't have hypertension and doesn't have a hemorrhage within the classic location within these basal ganglia here, that's when you want to start thinking about getting a CTA of the head with contrast, looking for some sort of vascular anomaly to cause the hemorrhage. In an older patient, someone, let's say 70 or older, if you see hemorrhage within the lobes, like in the temporal lobe, frontal lobe, parietal lobe, more superiorly than what we see on this image, the other thing you want to think about is cerebral amyloid angiopathy. Amyloid is implicated in a lot of diseases, most notably Alzheimer's, but there is a separate entity that is sometimes also seen with dementia patients but can happen independently, and that is cerebral amyloid angiopathy, where this abnormally folded protein is deposited within the vessels. The vessel walls become not as strong as they previously were, and it makes you prone to hemorrhage. So an older patient with a parenchymal hemorrhage, in the absence of trauma, think about cerebral amyloid angiopathy. But older patients can also have vascular abnormalities as well. And the recommendation, at least that I've been taught, is if you have someone with a parenchymal hemorrhage that isn't classic for a basal ganglia type hemorrhage, think about getting a CTA if you're the clinician to evaluate the arteries within the brain to make sure there's not some sort of underlying vascular abnormality. On to the next case, and I'm going to scroll through it and just see if anything pops out to you. This one is a little bit on the more subtle side. This is a patient with a history of trauma. Anytime you hear trauma, you worry about bleeding. There are different types of bleeding. So in this case, there is hemorrhage along the this is called the tentorium. This is the right tentorial leaflet. It is the band that kind of covers the posterior fossa, which houses the cerebellum. So notice how it's a little bit thicker on this side, and there's that convexity there that I'm outlining with my mouse compared to that side where it's nice and smooth. That is a tentorial subdural hematoma. This is a classic picture. You don't want to miss this, especially in older patients that fall that are on anticoagulation. You don't want to miss this and then have them go home and continue to bleed. If these get bigger, then you start worrying about mass effect, herniation, potentially obstructive hydrocephalus if you obstruct the ventricular system. So if you see abnormal thickening of the tentorium, and it can be pretty subtle, just like in this case, think about calling a subdural. If you're not sure, you can recommend a short interval follow-up in six hours. But generally, this is a nice classic appearance, and the more of these you'll see, the more this will stand out, and it ends up not being so subtle after you've seen about 100 of these. So that's an acute right tentorial leaflet subdural hematoma. This is a companion case. This one is not subtle whatsoever. This is another subdural hematoma with extensive complications related to the mass effect of the subdural hematoma. So this hyperdensity along the right cerebral convexity is obviously all blood. It is a subdural hemorrhage. It's got that crescentic shape rather than a biconvex shape that we'll talk about later, which would be an epidural hemorrhage. This crescentic shape is classic for a subdural hematoma. When they get this big, you start to worry about mass effect. So you can have shift with, of the brain within the very enclosed cranial vault. The skull doesn't allow for much change in position because it's a relatively enclosed space, so it can only fit so much. So if you have expanding hemorrhage, the brain parenchyma starts to be pushed aside, and that is exactly what's happening here. The right lateral ventricle is being significantly compressed by the hemorrhage. And there is also shift of the intracranial contents in the brain across the falcs into the left side of the cranial vault. And one other thing you have to think about is ventricular entrapment. So when you have midline shift like this, the ventricular system can be obstructed. And as we see here, the left lateral ventricle is very dilated. If you look at this temporal horn here, this is the temporal horn of the left lateral ventricle. It's very dilated because this ventricle is basically entrapped and flow of CSF is obstructed. So you have resultant obstructive hydrocephalus from the mass effect related to this midline shift. This is another classic case, and this can happen if you were to miss a smaller one, like the one we just saw, and the patient went home and continued anticoagulation, you can have worsening hemorrhage and you can have this type of outcome where there is midline shift and obstructive hydrocephalus. So this case, I talked about an epidural hematoma, and I just wanted to show this one because this is a good look for an epidural hematoma. If you remember the previous case, there was the more crescent-shaped hemorrhage along the right cerebral convexity. In this case, this is an epidural hematoma, and it has that lens shape. There's kind of a biconvex shape, and it looks like a lens almost looks like an eye. That is an epidural hematoma. In my experience, these are less common than the subdurals, but they do happen. They can be either venous or arterial bleeding. 
And a lot of times these are associated with skull fractures. And sure enough, in this case, there is a fracture. This is your fracture here. You can kind of still see the blood there and you have a fracture right there. So these are commonly associated with fractures. This is something clinically you hear about the lucid interval. A patient will fall and lose consciousness and then wake back up and you think they're okay. And then they continue to bleed and then they die. So if someone hits their head significantly and has a loss of consciousness, they need to go to the emergency room for a CT because you don't want to miss an epidural hematoma or let one continue to bleed and the patient can potentially die. This case is not subtle at all. This is a case of acute diffuse I'd say moderate to large volume subarachnoid hemorrhage. This density, again, hyperdensity within the brain is typically blood. This is occupying a lot of the brain. We see it in the cerebral sulci along the convexities here, the interhemispheric fissure along the midline. It's in the basilar cisterns. These are called the basilar cistern. This is the supracellar cistern, to be more specific. These are just different compartments of CSF that surround the brain and the brain stem. You see the hemorrhage in the sylvian fissure. This is the sylvian fissure here. This is the sylvian fissure on the right side. So this subarachnoid hemorrhage is everywhere. When you see diffuse subarachnoid hemorrhage like this, you have to worry about a ruptured aneurysm. And to diagnose this as a clinician, the scan that you want to order next, if you see this, is a CTA of the head. A CTA of the head will opacify the intracranial arteries and you can potentially find an aneurysm. If you do find an aneurysm, then you want to get on the phone with interventional neuroradiology to come in and they could potentially coil it or do something to stop the bleeding aneurysm. So this is acute subarachnoid hemorrhage. Next step would be CTA and then getting on the phone with interventional radiology. One other thing I'll say is you can also see this in trauma, particularly if it's just kind of peripheral. Like if you just saw the hemorrhage here out in the right cerebral hemisphere and you don't see it in the basilar cisterns and everywhere else, and the patient has a history of fall, you can blame it on trauma. But in something like this that's diffuse, you definitely don't want to miss an aneurysm. One last case is a companion case to the last one. And you may notice again, there's relative hyperdensity within the basilar cisterns and the sylvian fissures. You may think, oh, this is another case of acute subarachnoid hemorrhage. Well, this is a different situation. This is called pseudo subarachnoid hemorrhage. The reason I included this case is I've had ER doctors call me because to their credit, they're opening up the scans and looking at the scans themselves and they're very busy. That's a great thing to do. And they see this and they think, oh, this is another subarachnoid hemorrhage. This actually isn't subarachnoid hemorrhage. This is pseudo subarachnoid hemorrhage. This is a patient that has had severe anoxic brain injury. As you can see, there is no clear margin between the cortex and the subcortical white matter. There is a complete loss of gray-white differentiation in this patient. This patient is someone that probably had a prolonged cardiac arrest and wasn't getting perfusion to their brain adequate enough to keep up with the metabolic demands, and this patient developed cerebral edema and anoxic brain injury. Basically, they had a stroke of their whole brain. That's a way you can look at it. This density within the sylvian fissures and subarachnoid space looks like blood, but it's just because there is edema everywhere else. It kind of fakes you out, so there's actually no blood there. It's kind of confusing for me to explain it, so I included the link in the description to pseudo subarachnoid hemorrhage. That is a review of all my must-know neuroradiology cases. Thank you so much. I hope they're helpful. Again, if you're a clinician and want a quick answer, never hesitate to open up the CT scan by yourself and take a look. Thanks for watching.